Well, good morning, Mountain West. How you feeling? Man, wasn't that incredible? Oh, man, really, really enjoyed. I'm so glad y'all are here uh, at our 9 a.m. gathering and just excited about what God is doing. Y'all, a couple of things before we get into week two of uh, The Promise. La- yesterday, we had the awesome opportunity of serving our city, and I just want you to see a little recap of what we were able to do uh, this week because of your faithfulness in serving and being the hands and feet of Jesus. I think we got a video of it um, here. Y'all, that's just a small recap. Yeah, that's it's something worth celebrating. That's just a small recap of all the things we were able to do. Um, We were at two different um, uh, hotels that um, people who probably would not have Christmas, and we got to see kids go ahead and shop through and serve them in that capacity. Uh, We were able to serve our first responders at the Tucker PD Prince precinct and just so many different things down in her park in downtown Atlanta serving the homeless and really that's our opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a such a tangible way and just grateful uh, to be a part of a church that sees that as um, a priority so thank you guys Um, we are going into week two of this series called the promise and y'all Um, Normally, I am a get everything done by Monday kind of guy, and I like to have my sermons written and done by Monday, but I struggled this week with the the message, um, so much so that Wednesday, I just, uh, I left the office and went home, and it was so chaotic in our house. All three boys were screaming and running and ripping, and in the midst of chaos, God gave me a message on peace. Beautiful, beautiful. So the Lord has a sense of humor. So uh, if you have your Bibles, would you go with me to Isaiah chapter 11? Go ahead and stand with me. Isaiah chapter 11, starting at verse 1. And sometimes y'all think I'm joking. That literally is what happened. Tiana looked at me and said, how in the world can you do this in the midst of this? I was like, "Uh, God is teaching me right now in this moment. Isaiah chapter 11, starting at verse 1. It says, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Go down to verse six with me. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion and a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put his hand in the nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as the water fill the sea, so the earth shall be filled with people who know the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I pray for your anointing today, and I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would say in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Friends, uh, it is to my shock that I'm a big music guy, I love music, love worship, and uh, love all sorts of music, but this week I learned some secrets about some songs that I had no idea about. Like, this whole time, I'm thinking, Isn't She Lovely is about somebody Stevie loves, and it's a romantic relationship, it's about the birth of his baby daughter, right? You think uh, Whitney Houston, 
made it famous, but Dolly Parton wrote it, um, I Will Always Love You, that's not romantic either. That was about a business partnership. And don't get me started with TLC chasing waterfalls. I don't want to chase the waterfalls they're talking about. It's interesting how you can make an assumption of something, but that's not what it really means. One of my favorites uh, to look at and really understand is the, the famous song Silent Night. Silent Night, Holy Night, all was calm. Uh, here, here's the part that really confuses me. Sleep in heavenly peace. What does that look like? What does heavenly peace look like? For a parent with three young children, heavenly peace, um, I, I don't know what that looks like yet. Maybe those of you who have graduated them into adulthood can Help me understand, but heavenly peace is something that God desires for his children to have. To live in this peace that, as scripture describes, surpasses all understanding. I don't know about you, but as I look in our world today, it's very difficult to have peace. There, there seems to be tension everywhere you look. And, and in fact, if uh, you believe the research, their anxiety is at an all-time high. Worry about the future is at an all-time high. And peace is on the decline, not just in our minds, but in our world. There is rumors and rumors of war. There is so many things happening, and yet the number one thing people ask for, you, you look at any of these beauty pageants or any of these things, they, they want world peace. They want peace. Our biblical passage is Isaiah speaking prophetically about what will be and what is to come. He, he speaks prophetically in verse 1 and 2 about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, giving them details about his lineage. It's part of the reason why Matthew traces Jesus' genealogy because he wanted you to understand that this Jesus is connected to the prophecy that comes out of Isaiah. But then verse 6 through 9 is a head-scratcher. What, what do goats and lambs and, I mean, uh, outside of being really good food, what does that have to do with a promise of peace? If you would permit me, I, I want to show you in this text that is prophetic primarily what God is speaking to those who read it originally and what echoes to us today about the truth of God's peace. Four places of uh, truths about God's peace in this text that I believe will help us in the days ahead, help us to apply God's peace to our lives. Here's, a, here's the first one. Real peace is more than a place or a thing. I, I can't tell you how many times we have tried to put our peace in a thing. I, I just feel so at peace when I get to this particular place. And I, I just feel at peace in, in nature and all of these things. And I'm not saying those are negative things. Here, here's what I'm trying to help you see is that biblical peace is more than a place or a thing. And if you only put your uh, description of peace into a place or a thing, your peace will be fleeting and limited and not sustained like God's design for peace in your life. It's more than place or thing. In fact, the biblical word for peace in the Hebrew is a word called shalom. Now, when we think of peace, it's just, you know, hey, everything is calm and bright. Everything is chill. There, there's no tension but the Hebrew definition of peace is so much more complex than that. It, the, that word shalom had four parts to it as far as how, how, what peace looked like. Uh, that, that word shalom speaks to wholeness and completeness. And here were the four parts is that you would be healthy physically. Here, here's the definition, shalom, of peace. That 
you had peace in your physical body, that you were healthy physically, that you were in right relationships, covenant, that you had peace in your relationships, that you, you had victory over your enemies, that there was no war or foot, that there was a lack of tension there, and that there was prosperity and fruitfulness in your life. This whole encompassing peace. So when they would say shalom to somebody, here's, here's what they were really saying. May your life be blessed with healthy living body, healthy relationships, prosperity and fruitfulness in what you do, and victory over your enemies. That kind of peace is a little bit different than the peace we describe. That, that's an all-encompassing peace. And so many times we are searching for peace in our life, peace in our mind, peace in our body, peace in our relationships, and we search in so many places. We read all the different books. Can I tell you that peace is not a place to find. Peace is a person to know. That that peace is not some, some abstract thing that you're going to search and look for. That peace is a real person, and he is, as Scripture describes him in, in Isaiah 9 and 6, he is literally the prince of peace. Peace is a person to know, and that person is Jesus. Here, here's what he says in John 16 and 33. He said, I've said these things to you that in me... You may have peace. Friends, I don't know what you walked in with. I don't know what you're, you're dealing with, what you're challenged with, what you, you hide behind the, the church smile and the plastic smile. But here's what I want you to know, that if you don't hear anything else today, that you can have peace in Jesus, that there is a name above every other name, that at his name, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, that at his name, demons tremble, at his name, seas begin to uh, pause and the winds and the waves calm, at his name, there is victory, and he invites us to have peace in him. We have peace in Jesus. And here's what Isaiah starts in verse 1 and 2, trying to help us understand that we would recognize who this person is. Here's why he describes it from the root of David. It's because Israel's original peace comes through the person of David. God works through David and brings peace to the nation of Israel, peace on all their sides. And when he wants to bring peace to the world, through the root of David comes Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Can can I tell you the second truth about peace? Is that real peace creates space of reconciliation where there was hostility. The, the, The point of peace, shalom, is to put to end of the hostilities. And for us, brothers and sisters, there's two versions of hostilities that we've got to deal with. The first is reconciling us to God. That, that's the first piece that we, we've got to deal with or challenge with, is that we've got to be reconciled to God. Here's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 says. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. I I need you to understand, friends, that real peace is expensive. Right? The temporary peace that we have is really um, what I like to call, we like to numb ourselves out of the anxiety and the tension that we feel. Some of us do it in throwing ourselves into our work. Some of us do it by throwing ourselves into uh, uh, games or videos. or we, we find something to numb the pain, and we think that's a false peace. Real peace is super expensive. Here's one of the ways to tell how expensive something is, is if the counterfeits are expensive, you know the real thing is really expensive. 
You know, when I went to New York, um, walking down the street, um, they had, you know, Fluey and Gucci, Gucci, I think, and some of the Sha Now um, and all these other things. But the price for the fake ones were hundreds of, of dollars. All that told me was the real thing was really expensive. How much have you spent on false peace? How much time have you wasted trying to create peace on your own? Can I I tell you the only way that you can receive peace is through Jesus? Because Jesus was the only one who could afford to purchase the peace that you need that we couldn't pay for the peace that we're looking for, that nothing that we could do, here's what scripture says, that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Nothing we could do could purchase the peace that we desired, but Jesus in his mercy, God in his kindness, sent his son born of a woman who lived a sinless life and died on a cross for us so that we might be reconciled to God so we could have peace with our heavenly father. This is the gospel. It is not about what you can do. It's about what Jesus has done. He's reconciled us back to himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He was the only one who could afford it. Now now we have peace with God. But can I tell you the second part of this reconciliation, and I wanted to show you in Isaiah eleven six. 6, it says, in the day the wolf and the lamb will live together, the leopard will lie down with the baby goat, the calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. All right? Here's what he is saying. Isaiah is using imagery of that time that they would understand. Here's what he is saying is two people who are normally at At odds with each other and enemies, the lion and the lamb do not get along because the lion wants to destroy the lamb. Here's what he is saying, that when this son of Jesse, David's lineage comes, Jesus is going to put an end to the enmity between man and God, but between man and each other. That God didn't just send Jesus to reconcile us back to God, but to make a way for there to be reconciliation with each other. That God desires for us to reconcile with each other. Here's what Ephesians 2 and 14 says. For Christ himself has bought, has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his body on the cross, he brought down the walls of hostility that separated us. 2 Corinthians 5 and 18 All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Hear me, friends. The peace Jesus offers is not just about making it right with God. It's about getting it right with others. Can I I go even further? You haven't experienced the fullness of Jesus' peace while you're still at odds with somebody else. That that Jesus' peace, in fact, here's what his challenge to us is, as it is to you, live in peace with everybody. You know that person you don't like? God, God calls us to live in peace with them. You know the person who deserves your disdain, God calls us to be reconciled. And and let me frame this. Reconciliation doesn't mean that you need to be stupid. Okay? Excuse me if that's too forward. Here's what I, I mean, is that reconciliation doesn't mean that if somebody hits you over the head with a bat, that you need to say, okay, here you go. Scripture also encourages us to not throw our pearls before swine, to to be wise in this. But the truth of the matter is, friends, God calls his people not to just have a vertical 
relationship that has been reconciled, but to make sure the horizontal relationships have been reconciled as well. And if I could be your pastor in this moment, where is the Holy Spirit bringing up into your life, into your heart, where you need to be reconciled with others? Can I tell you what the Bible says? 1 John 4 and 20 says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I'm not saying this is easy. Here's my challenge to you, is to pursue peace because you've experienced peace with God. That, that I, I'm going to go after peace with others because God has given me peace. And, and if you were saying, Pastor, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do that. I, I'm glad. Here's number three. God's peace changes our nature. You may not have the feeling to do it on your own. But what the Lord says he'll do is he will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What that means is he'll give you a heart that is willing to obey the hard things that he's asking you to do. Can, can, can I show it to you in the text? He says, the cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. Friends, Bears don't eat grass. They like fish. Lions don't eat grass. But here's what the Lord is saying in the picture. is even when you want re revenge, I'm going to give you a heart of forgiveness. Even when you want to destroy them, I'm going to give you a heart that wants to reconcile with them. When you don't want to do it, God says, I will give you a heart that is willing to do the hard things. I'll change your nature. I'll change. And this... This is the number one reason why I, I encourage, I admonish, I implore you to let God change your heart before you try to start changing your behavior because if he doesn't change your heart, your behaviors will never match up long term. God wants to give you a heart that is willing to obey him, willing to change your nature. See, if you don't experience this peace, you, you wouldn't know that there's a better way. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if you feel like you're struggling, here, here's what the scripture says. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And you're saying to me, Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Here, here's my encouragement to you today. Jesus is committed into making you into the person that he wants you to be. Your, your role in the process is to surrender to him and stop putting unrealistic expectations on yourself. Okay? Peter walked with Jesus for three years and was still cussing. God eventually got his tongue and changed it. But you, you are not going to be some soup. Very rarely do I see there are some people who is instant transformation. Here's what I have found. Most of the time, God takes you step by step. This is why we're a church of next steps, willing to walk with people through the next step of their discipleship with Jesus. Because you will not be perfected until the day of Jesus Christ. God, God will find you anywhere you are, but he, he takes responsibility to say, if you are willing to let me, I will make you into the person that, you, that he wants you to be. Okay. Here, here, here's what 2 Corinthians 3, 16 says. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil, the veil that blinded you from seeing the truth is taken away. For the Lord is spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God and the Lord who is spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. God takes responsibility in making you into the person he wants you to be. Our job is to surrender to that transformation, that, that real peace that he offers us, not just peace with God, 
peace with others and the peace to know that he is making me into a person that can help reconcile bad relationships, that can restore people that, that have been far. Can, can I tell you a, a testimony real quick? Is There was a young lady who started attending our church a few months ago. She was here on serve day uh, yesterday and absolutely broken. Every relationship in her life was broken. But she came to church here and God began to do a work in her life. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. She was baptized in this church and at the reconciliation between her and God, God began to do something in the, her life. You see, her family's from California and every relationship out there was severed. But as God restored her to himself, he began to reconcile those relationships. And now, friends, she is moving back home to restored relationships, praising God that as he restored her, he restored the broken places in her life. God wants to do that in your world. Can I tell you the fourth and final place of peace? The truth about God's peace is that God's peace is to make things right for now and eternity. Here's what he says. He will keep in perfect peace of mind stayed on him. Jesus' peace for now, that shalom, that all-encompassing peace, is a keeping peace in this temporal world. God's ultimate peace is to let you know that there's a day coming that he's going to change everything. Can, can I read the rest of this Isaiah passage? He says, the baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put his hand in the nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Friends, this is a picture of God reconciling what was broken in the world. This is a picture of God recreating Eden, what was marred and broken in Eden, God will restore in the end. And I know we live in such a fallen world and what this world wants us to do is zoom in and focus on the here and now. But every now and then, friends, you've got to zoom out and realize this world is not my home. That there is a, oh my God, I feel your anointing. There is a day coming where God is going to make everything right. That we will have a peace eternally. A peace with Jesus. Here, here, here's Jesus' peace is knowing. It's knowing your past, present, and future are secure in him. Secure in him. Here's what Revelation 21, verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is the promise of your God. You know why I could sleep in heavenly peace, friends? It's not because everything is going right. It's because I know there's a God who's going to make things right. You know why I could sleep in heavenly peace? It's not that I've got the best security system. It's not that I've got a, a, a Smith & Weston or something in the draw next to the bed. It, it, it's not because of any of those things, friends. It's because I know who my God is and I know what he has said about what he plans for his children. So wherever you find yourself in life today, friends, you can be at peace. That peace is found in Jesus. That your past that the enemy reminds you of is reconciled with him. That the present that you're fighting in, he's keeping you through it. 
but your future, your future is secure in Jesus Christ. Now, friends, everything that I just said is only true if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Can, can I come to your doorstep real, real quick? Here's the truth. Real peace is only found in Jesus Christ and you've got to make a decision whether or not you're going to accept the peace that God offers. The days of us playing church are over. We, we've got to decide whether or not we're going to receive the peace that God offers. Today, he says, I knock on the door. Will you, will you answer me? Today, I... I offer you peace. Will you receive it? Would, would you stand with me? We're going to pray in a moment. Thank you, Lord. If you know you need the peace that I'm talking about, you've been doing church your whole life, but you know you need that peace, don't leave here today without receiving the peace that God offers. Today, make a decision. And when you make that decision, here, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Is you need to let someone know. Here's how you let us know. There's a connect card there that says follow Jesus. If you mark that and bring it to us, we're going to walk with you through your next steps. But today is the day that you say yes to Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your power and your anointing in the room. God, we feel the weight of your glory. And in this moment, God, we surrender to you. We surrender to your will, to your way, God. And we say yes. Thank you for reminding us, God, that every other thing that we try to put our peace in will fail us, but you will never fail us. Thank you for reminding us, God, that you have given us this ministry of reconciliation. And God, I pray for boldness and humility to pursue reconciliation. God, I, I pray for families now. Every broken place, God, be restored in the mighty name of Jesus. Every severed relationship, God, be restored in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for forgiveness to well up, God, and spring forth and produce fruit in the lives of your people, God. God, for those who are struggling with whether or not they are secure in you, I pray that they would feel the security of their salvation knowing that no one can snatch them from the arms of Jesus. That they have been made right in you, Lord. God, and right now I pray for the person who needs to say yes to you, God. I pray for the person that has wandered and played or uh, who, who's unsure. God, I pray today would be their day. And if that's you, I want you to pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, save me. Change me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you today. I receive your salvation and I receive your peace. And Father, I pray over your people now. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the peace of God reign in their hearts, God. Let the peace of God take away every anxiety, every fear every trepidation God and let your peace rule and reign in their hearts God we push back against the darkness now and I pray for the Spirit of God to come alive in your people today God move by your power move by your strength and we will give you the glory honor and praise because you deserve it in Jesus name we pray and every heart say amen amen and amen come on let's give God a praise hallelujah Jesus